All right, welcome back to the Naval News segment today. Uh, we're going to begin with Fleet Tracker. This is provided to us by USNI News. So full credit to uh, the U.S. Naval Institute for providing this uh, unclassified brief information. We have the USS George H.W. Bush, CVN-77, doing some uh, training operations in the Vay Capes. That's the Virginia operating area, off the coast of Virginia there. Uh, Ronald Reagan is still in the Ara Sea of Arabia, Arabian Sea, Arabian Sea, uh, with the Iwo Jima. They had been supporting our withdrawal from uh, Afghanistan. Um, sadly, a lot of the casualties we had there at the very end came from the Iwo Jima ARG. Uh, very, very sad. Uh, the SX ARG is transiting, uh, presumably to the Persian Gulf. We really don't know, but you can see it right there, uh, transiting. Uh, it's south of uh, India right now. And the Carl Vinson Carrier Strike Group is uh, doing its thing in the South China Sea. Uh, they went to sea in August uh, 5th, about a month ago. They, um, the, the Carl Vinson stayed about two weeks off the coast of San Diego doing some work up, getting everybody ready for their long deployment. And that long deployment is underway right now in the South China Sea. We're going to talk about all these fleets today, but this is just an overview of what we're going to talk about. So let's go ahead and get back to this and let's start scrolling. So the U.S. Navy Battle Force as of time of this recording is 296 ships. Uh, again, we expect that to be the same by the end of the year because we are going to decom one ship and commission another one. So they're going to balance each other out. Um, so total ships underway are, are 84, which is really not many. Usually this number is closer to a hundred uh, total, total deployed ships in fleets is only 66. So you can kind of like do the math and say, well, 18 are out there doing independent operations. A lot of these 18 are submarines and we don't talk about where they go at all ever. Um, but let's start with the North Arabian Sea. Uh, sailors stand for a frocking ceremony on the flight deck after aircraft carrier Ronald Reagan CVN-76 in the Arabian Sea, September 7th. So whenever you get promoted in the United States Navy, uh, you're allowed to wear your new promotion before you actually start getting paid for it. And the so getting the award, getting the rank is called, is called a frocking. And then uh, depending on the rank, it's usually three, six, or months already it can even be a whole year a full 12 months before you actually get paid for for that rank yeah and it's not a way to save money that's not what that's about it's giving you the responsibility of your new rank uh before it kind of kicks in to see if you can handle the leadership demands you know the stress and all that stuff because during the time that you're frocked and the time you begin getting paid you can still be demoted for for dereliction of duty, for example, You're not just being able to perform at that new level. So these sailors here are going to receive their new rank in this ceremony, uh, and they're going to begin performing those duties right away if they're not already doing it. Honestly, a lot of these guys that are being promoted have already been performing at a high level. This is why they're being promoted, right? And then they'll begin getting paid uh, a little bit after that. All right, let's move down. There she is, boys. That's the USS Ronald Reagan. She's been at sea for a long time. I think it's been June or July. So was that going on four months now? Um, yeah, so uh, she's she's really, you know, probably getting tired. The crew at this point is probably pretty exhausted, especially where they're at. They're in the Arabian Sea in the summertime. It's very hot down there. And so, uh, they, but they, they have to stay focused, especially whenever they're doing operations like this with the carrier air wing you know, launching these uh, birds off the deck. That's a very hazardous job. Here we have aviation machinist mate, first class Pablo. Holy cow, that's a lot of words. Uh, signals an F-18E uh, Super Hornet uh, to, to uh, take off. All right, cool. And these are all the, uh, we've gone over these before. We're not going to do it again, but these are all the air wings that are deployed with the Reagan right now. And of course the Shiloh. Um, here we got some crew members lighting a bong in the engine room. That's not, you shouldn't do that guys. Uh, we have, the, no, I'm just kidding. Let's go back to that. This is the sailors uh, conducting repairs on board the guided missile destroyer USS Halsey. Halsey's with the uh, Ronald Reagan as well. Uh, the Gulf of Oman, we have a chief petty officer here. What's he doing? Chief logistics uh, specialist uh, Brian Barnaby uh, assigned to the WASP amphibious class ship USS Iwo Jima, LHD-7, places binding straps on cargo uh, replenishment at sea. Okay, so this cargo looks like, looks like he's cutting them. It says that he's placing them, but you can see right there, he just cut that one. 
All right, very cool. Uh, the South China Sea here. Okay, here's the Carl Vinson. These are the guys that have just freshly gone underway. They've been underway for a total of about a month now, and they're uh, doing their patrols in the South China Sea. And here they have a, a missile decoy next to the uh, carrier to defend it from any kind of attack. We have a carrier air wing two. Looks like they're doing some kind of, uh, what's this called, vert rep, I think. Yeah, it's an unrep if it's underway, but it's a vertical rep if it's heloed. And with these things, I'm not sure what they call this. A forklift offloads cargo from CMV-22 Bravo Osprey assigned to the Titan uh, of the fleet logistic a multi-mission squadron VRM-30 aboard the Nimitz-class aircraft carrier Carl Vinson. Okay, there you go. They're getting their supplies from something. Hell, you would think that the Carl Vinson would be sending supplies to other ships, but yeah. All right. Oh, look at, oh, look at this guy. Holy smokes. Yeah. Look at his biceps right there. Mm, mm, mm. Okay. So they're doing some kind of sailors on board. Arleigh Burke guided missile cruiser, USS O'Kane, uh, practice transporting a sailor during a stretcher bear. Oh God. I had to be this dude once tied down to a stretcher. It's kind of fun because you don't have to do the drill and everyone's carrying you around, but they can make fun of you. They can uh, put little things on your face. Yeah. Whenever the drill monitors aren't looking. Yeah. Like, once you get tied down here, they mess with you. I've been this guy before. Well, I've been this guy, and I've been this guy. Yeah. Anyway, uh, in the Indian Ocean, here we have, uh, oh, wow, that's a really cool ship. That's one of our um, LH somethings, LH, LH, LPD, that's what it is. The amphibious transport dock ship, uh, USS Portland, uh, LH, LPD, rather, uh, 27 Cadex Flight Operations. These are really cool-looking ships. These these support the Marine Corps and the Marine Corps operations. Uh, these these masts are really cool. All right, here we have a, uh, a crayon ceremony on the deck of the, uh, with, with, with Marines, on the deck of the USS Essex, LHD2. So here they go, they, they, they worship the crayons. It looks like it's Red Crayon Night. Uh, let's see what the... Description says here, it says unmanned aerial vehicle operators uh, supporting the 11th Marine Expeditionary Unit prepared to launch a VBAT, the unmanned aerial system on board amphibious transport dock USS Portland, the one we just saw the picture of. Very cool. These are really cool drones because they can take off vertically. They don't take a lot of deck space. So even smaller ships like the LCS could launch these drones if they wanted to. And uh, this looks like the drone operator. And this guy's literally laying hands on the, on the VBAT. So I don't know what the procedure is for that. But I wouldn't want to be standing next to it whenever it took off. <laughs> oh, man. And here in, uh, in Japan, we have the 7th Fleet Band welcomes the British Royal Navy aircraft carrier. Queen Elizabeth is in Japan this week. Hey, man, she's, she's hitting all the ports. She hit Guam, Okinawa, and now she's up in Japan. And look at these whites. One, I don't know when they added the black stripes on the cuffs. That was after I left the Navy. They used to not be like that. Oh, and they got black stripes on. This used to be all white, an all white uniform, but now they got little black accents on it. But one thing that you may say that this looks sloppy and it does intentionally. Notice how nobody's pants fit properly. The, that's just the way these uh, these jumper pants are are cut. They're not designed. They're, they're, they're designed to look kind of baggy. And I don't think that looks good at all, but that's how these uniforms are made. Some people that I worked with later in my career, like senior enlisted uh, E6s and stuff, would get their pants tailored so it didn't look this bad. And you would get in trouble for modifying your uniform if you did that. Uh, but a lot of us did because it just looks terrible. And if you have any sort of a gut whatsoever, like this sailor probably doesn't have as big a gut as you think he's got. But it accents, you know, you want to be a skinny, skinny sailor in, the, in, in these uniforms. Oh, and, and notice the knots. His knot is pretty good. Uh, this one's really good too, but this poor sailor, look how droopy his knot is. And that's just the way the, the uh, neckerchief goes, man. This is, a. Uh, it, it, it never looks good. A lot of us, whenever, um, or early in my career, we would go to the uniform shop and they would roll your neckerchief for you and tie it as well. And then you could put like a piece of tape around it to keep it tight until you needed to wear it. Then you can take the tape off. Uh, and that's that's some of the tricks that I did when I was uh, wearing this uniform. All right, Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, this is actually in Haiti here. This is a picture of Haiti. You can see there's some damage to the pier here. Haiti had a terrible earthquake a few uh, weeks ago, and uh, they need a lot of help. And we were doing an operation. Um, what was it called? Um, 
what was it called? Here we go. The Navy's large scale exercise 2021 when the earthquake hit. So the Navy took a couple of ships uh, off the operation and sent them down to Haiti to provide uh, medical and U.S. aid assistance. And uh, that's what the USS Arlington here is doing. They're normally stationed out of Norfolk, but here they're pulling into uh, Haiti to provide assistance, food and medical really happy to see us doing that just because we're able to help other nations and and we we give them the help uh in the western atlantic this is the uh george hw bush they're uh, doing some fire drills this poor guy this is summertime in the western atlantic this guy's sweating this he, he would be sweating in the winter time in this firefighting ensemble and look at all the people looking at him they're like boy i'm glad it's not us <laughs> As this guy walks the line, uh, according to the right up here, it says the sailor responds to a simulated fire on the flight deck during a mass casualty drill on board USS George H.W. Bush. They're doing some kind of workup. I guess they're going to be going uh, on deployment next. In addition to these major formations not shown are thousands of others serving in submarines, individual ships, aircraft squadrons, SEALs, special purpose, uh, Marine Ground Control Task Forces, CBs, Coasties, EODs, and all the other Bs. All right, really cool stuff. I mean, that's that's what our Navy's doing this week around the globe. You know, they're getting promoted. They're helping people. Um, you know, the, the Afghanistan evacuation is finished. We're done with that. Really good stuff. Uh, what, do, what do you guys think of this? Does anybody in the chat have anyone deployed right now? Because if we do, we want to give them a shout out. Uh, the Independence Class LCS demoted to missile decoy. Yeah, that's, that's all it's good for, man. Yep. They need to hang some radar reflectors on it so it's not as stealthy as these... What are CBs? CBs are the Navy construction battalions. They go in and they uh, can turn pretty much any stretch of land into an airfield, a port, a naval base, an air base even. Uh, they really got uh, famous or a lot of credit for building the airfield on Guadalcanal in World War II. And that was the beginning of our island hopping all the way up to Japan in, in World War II. Uh, they're very hardworking people. Uh, they don't get enough credit. They, they do... Uh, like whenever we go to Iraq or Afghanistan and we want to build those uh, barracks and stuff, uh, the CBs do all that stuff. They'll, they'll come in, they'll put up the temporary tents so you have a place to sleep on night one. And over the course of the next few days or even weeks, they'll build actual buildings that are barracks, mess halls, training places, command CIC control centers. Uh, the CBs do all that. I'm sure the Army has their own brigade, but the Navy has their own construction battalion as well, and we call them CBs. Uh, oh, hey, uh, the bar gunner says his dad was World War II CB, so he knows uh, exactly what I'm talking about. John Wayne did a film with him. Did he really? What's the name of that film? I love John Wayne films. Uh, I'll go back and watch that one if you remember the name. Uh, the fam guy says, I don't doubt the CBs are great, but the only one I've met IRL were horrible workers. Oh, no. Well, you know, you, there's always the one, right? Yeah, I'm sorry you had to meet a, a bad egg. Like even Sonerman, I've met Sonerman that were not passionate at all about the job. And if you don't have some kind of uh, passion, because sonar is part art form and science. So anybody can learn the math and the science part. But if you don't have a knack for sonar, you'll never be great. You know, you'll just be an okay sonar operator. So my point in bringing that up is every rate has really good performers and not so good performers. And I have to admit, in, in my career, I kind of seesaw it a little bit. I wasn't always putting forth my best effort. So anyway, hopefully the guy that you uh, know uh, tur turns that around, okay? John Wayne says the film on CBs was pretty good. Oh, it's called The Fighting CBs. I'll have to look that up. I honestly didn't know he had done that one. 1944, so he filmed it during the war. Wow. John Wayne, man, what a, what a guy. All right, let's go on to the next story here. Uh, from USNI News continues. This one's written by Sam Legrone and Mallory Shelborn, two great journalists that we often reference here. Uh, today they're talking about uh, Middle East will be the next test bed for our drone ships. Remember our drone ships that can fire the SM-6 missile are going to be deploying with our fleet next year. Well, they're going to be tested by themselves in the Middle East as the Navy expands its unmanned effort. Here's a picture of the ships we're talking about. These are the Rangers and the Nomad. These are minimal, minimally manned ships. So they can have a crew on board. You can obviously say they have a bridge and all that stuff. There are other ships that are completely unmanned, right? And uh, so they're both going to be going out to 
the Middle East. From the piece, they write, full of merchant traffic and security threats, the densely packed waterways of the Red Sea, Arabian Sea, and Persian Gulf will be a testing ground for the Navy's push to make unmanned systems a practical part of the fleet, uh, service leaders on Wednesday said. The U.S. Fifth Fleet Task Force 5-9 will stand up on Thursday and be the second testing outfit of the Navy's unmanned ships following the Surface Development Squadron 1, or Surf Dev Ron, uh, established in 2019. The goal of the task force, led by Captain Michael Brasser, is to expand the operation, operational use of unmanned platforms in the region and experiment with concept of operations. Instead of working mostly with unmanned aerial vehicles, the task force will help the Navy employ unmanned platforms across all domains, the U.S. Fifth Fleet Commander Vice Admiral Brad Cooper told reporters in a roundtable. He said, we're going to take today's unmanned systems, which are largely in the air, as you know, and we had we had the MQ-1 Predators, uh, the BASM-Ds, the airborne platforms out there of some for some time. What's going to be different is they're going to be augmenting the unmanned surface vessels as well, Cooper said. We haven't, we haven't had them in the past. We've, we have them now. It will be augmented and even more unmanned undersea vessels. We have had some in the past, and we're going to have a lot more in the future. So we're basically integrating unmanned ships and submarines into the fleet. This is a really cool um, unmanned vehicle this this mantis they they tested these in the great lakes and they were giving people rides like a person sits here and a person sits here and uh there's some engineers i guess in the back somewhere too and it can do like 100 knots and so you could go from like michigan to wisconsin in like an hour across the great lake yeah it's freaking great i wish i could have gone on that that would have been a great youtube video but uh, i didn't know about it until it was already done but they were giving people rides on this thing <laughs> all right um See, he continues to say, we were, we are clutched in the, in the Navy staff led unmanned process. We are clutched in the, okay. Uh, I'm not sure what he means by that. Here we go. The standup of task force five, nine comes as the Navy is crafting a larger surface effort to push unmanned systems. Okay. A lot of this is just political talk after that. This is one of the unmanned ships right here. It still has a bridge, but this one can literally go out and sail across the Pacific. It's, it's just crazy. Un completely unmanned. Now, there is something that they're going to have to consider, and they, I'm sure they already have considered this, is whenever they take these ships and they operate them off the coast of Somalia or off the coast of Iran, where they have all the small boats and stuff that are very fast, how are they going to prevent people from riding up to these things in high speeds and these high speed boats that they have in those countries and jumping on board? How are you going to repel borders if it's an unmanned vehicle? So I could see Iran trying its damnedest to get somebody on board this ship to cause damage, to steal stuff. Uh, they're not going to be able to take control of it, but they're going to, they could do damage to it for sure. This would be an Intel for them treasure trove. If they could get some uh, Iranian sailors on this just to grab anything, you know, now I'm sure they've thought of that. This is, I'm not giving that away, uh, but I wonder how they're going to deal with that. Are they going to have a manned vessel within a few miles? Cause that kind of defeats the purpose, doesn't it? You know, Maybe this unmanned solution is just an augmentation to our manned fleet. And that's how 2022 is going to be, is these things are going to be side by side with manned ships. I would not put these ships unmanned by themselves in high traffic areas because somebody inevitably, whether it's for malicious purposes or they're just a drunk boater, is going to try and jump on one of these things. And if you don't have somebody there to kick them back off, they're going to be able to do damage or, and take stuff. Yeah, a sea whiz. Yeah, now, we don't want to necessarily hurt anybody. No, they're just being vandals. OK, it's not you don't need to see whiz them. But I understand a sea whiz would, would fix that problem, wouldn't it? Uh, claymores and booby traps. Oh, man, you guys are going too far. Yeah, Bert, Bert, everybody in chat wants to murder the people jumping on board. What if it's a drunk sailor? I live on the Great Lakes now. I see drunk sailors all the time. People love to drink and boat like you. Obviously, in the United States, drinking and driving, big no-no. Drinking and boating, still a big no-no. Everybody I see does it. It's nuts here. My point is, some, some drunk sailor is going to jump on this thing out of fun. And we don't want to get them hurt, but we also don't want them doing that either. Uh, razor wire. Yeah, you could put like passive defenses like barbed wire and razor wire. Um, I don't know. 
USAF is already testing the Valkyrie wingman drone. Yeah, and the U.S. Navy has an unmanned drone that's uh, conducting fueling re or refueling, air to air refueling. So they don't have to use another F-18 with a bunch of external gas tanks to refuel other F-18s, which they do that as well still. Uh, but we have an unmanned aerial drone for refueling now. Uh, what about tear gas discharger? Yeah, something like that, like a tear gas uh, countermeasure would definitely work. And it might even have systems like that that they don't talk about on board. Because like I said, I'm sure they thought of that. There's no way that they that they didn't. This is a multi-billion dollar program right here. Yeah. Charge the deck with 10,000 volts. Oh my God. Yeah, water cannons. Water cannons are really effective. Uh, a lot of the merchant ships use water cannons to keep the Somali pirates you know, at, at bay whenever they try to get on board. Uh, and they also use barbed wire as well as a passive defense. All right, really good stuff. All right, let's move on to the next one.